Good afternoon, and welcome to the July 13th Legal and Finance Committee meeting. And I would like to start out with roll call and determination quorum. Here. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to go to the adoption of agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries. Now it's time for general public comment. If anybody from the audience has any general public comment, I don't have any here, so I will close that. Now we'll go to consent items, items one through eight, and we'll open public comment. And I don't have any of that either, so unless somebody has something they want to bring forward on public comment, I will close that also. Now I would like to know if there's anyone on the committee or anyone from staff that would like to remove any items, item one through eight. And Mr. Steve Lorente. Thank you, Chair. Item eight, please. Thank you. And Jerry would like to remove item three. So I would like a motion to approve one through eight, except for item three and eight. And I, all the ayes? Aye. No, it passes. First, we'll pull item three, acknowledge annual reports per counts, to council per Rapid City Municipal Code 2.40.080 and 3.28.048B. And Mr. Wright, you have the mic. I'd make a motion to approve, but I'd like to ask some questions of our public or finance officer. Go ahead. You have the floor, Mr. Wright. Thank you. Just for the public discussion is our current investments, our rate of return average approximately, and the interest rate we're paying on average approximately. And the other question I have, uh, since we're kind of into bonding, or excuse me, budgeting era, is equipment leasing. We, going back years ago, used to pay cash. We kind of got strapped for money, so we started lease purchasing so we could get the equipment we needed with the cash we had. Um, have we got any evaluation going on for our fleet replacement and so forth, when we're gonna, how we're gonna adjust that so we have the needs for our future replacement of fleet? Public, and you know, public works, fire, police, and everybody, thank you. Okay, I will start with the rate of return. It's usually a little over 5%. We do draw out the interest that we earn on our investments on a monthly basis to help with the operations of the city. And so usually at the end of the year, we have to do a market adjustment. I believe in 2015 it was actually a decrease for market value, but when you put the interest back in that we've earned throughout the year, it's still a positive. Yeah. But we usually have about a, around a 5% return on investment. I haven't looked at the the bond interest rate recently, um, but I would say we're usually between the average of about a three to four percent interest rate right now. I know a lot of our leases that we've done current or recently, as well as uh, just a loan that we've done, is right around the three percent mark. So we are earning more on our investments than what we're paying on the, that debt. The other question was on the fleet. There, there have been some steps in place. Some departments have moved to doing an outright purchase. Uh, the ones that come to mind are Solid Waste Collection. They just purchased recently uh, 10 or 11 new garbage trucks, uh, cash outright, because they had the cash on hand, so they did not have to lease that. The one prior was a lease. The other one that we've taken steps to for purchasing outright is with the fire department vehicles through the CIP fund. Those would be an outright purchase now instead of a lease. Uh, there are still, Ambulance Fund is still doing um, some, some leasing, and I know that the street department in general for the 2017 budget have originally proposed to do outright purchases as well, and, um, but that, we'll see how that shakes out in the end. 
I am not privy to any of the replacement schedules within those departments. Granted, I haven't asked for those either, but I do know that some departments, if not all, have some kind of a replacement schedule that they, it, that is their ultimate goal to replace, but sometimes it's not realistic to do so. May I, one more comment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, I think one thing that we as a community, as a city needs to do is move towards, it was being discussed in the last couple of years of a, uh, uh, an analysis of our fleet, total fleet, and how we can manage it. And I think we need to continue in that direction and, and further discussion on how we can manage our money so that we can keep our equipment current. And I know the areas that are hit the hardest probably are the streets and parks where they're property tax based versus the utilities. So thank you for your answer. I'm done. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wright. I see no more speakers. So all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? This passes. Now, item number eight, resolution number 2016-049 to increase solid waste clerk from 0.625% to one full-time employee. And Mr. Lorente, you have the mic. If I may, Chair, if I could uh, ask uh, Mr. Murbach a question on this particular issue. You may. Carl, I didn't see in the memo and I, I didn't see listed on the item. I just want to make sure that the position is currently open. Is that correct? Yes, the position uh, is currently open. Okay. Um, next question is, is this um, to be filled? Is there a plan for it to be filled this budget year? Or? Yes, we would like to, to do this. Again, this was an opportunity to get this filled now that we have an opening. Uh, since the last person that we did, did have was hired, as a part-time that fit their schedule but now we are now that we have an opportunity to fill this position we would like to move this to a full time so for solid waste division your line item on the budget are you going to need to supplement for this particular change we no we should not just with the absence and the time lag we should be good on budget okay thank you very much no more speakers uh, all in favor of this item? Aye. Now, all in favor of this motion. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Now we'll go to the non-consent items, item 9 through 12, and public comment is open. I have two speaker requests on item 10, and we will start with Jeff Kareem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. I'm uh, Jeff Harkar, I'm Director of Corporate Affairs for Black Hills Corporation, and thank you for um, just a quick moment here today. I just wanted to, to stand to um, say that we are um, still assessing uh, this, uh, this proposal, and that at this stage we don't have enough information to really know what the potential impacts of it could be to um, other, other TIDs in the area, including uh, TID 77. And so, we're looking forward to receiving more information about what the potential impacts could be and look forward to, to further discussion, um, whether that would impact um, uh, the, other, the other schedules and what's been approved through prior approval uh, TED agreements and the development plan that's already in place. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karam. Second speaker is on the same item, item 10, is Kent Haig. Uh, good afternoon, Commission. Uh, my name is Kent Haig, uh, president of Alta Terra Development Company. It's the development, it's the developer uh, uh, partner with uh, TIF number 70. Uh, today before you, we've had, uh, we have a request for the reallocation of line item costs that were set forth in the original uh, uh, project plan. And the reallocation of costs uh, is specifically provided for in the agreement, in the developer's agreement, in the project plan. One thing that's important to note, that this is a reallocation of costs, not an increase in the overall costs. The overall cost of $6.1 million uh, is, is, this is still you know, approximately $2 million below that. The, um, uh, 
So the, the, incre the increase, there's been no increase in the overall dollar amount of the TIF agreement. And there has been no increase in the size of the district, which is another thing that I know some folks have, have a concern that it would reset the base of the, of the, of the district. Um, and therefore it would take uh, a little longer because there hasn't been a lot of growth up till now. But it would take a little longer than for the thing to, for the, for the note to pay off. Uh, this does not do that. This does not reset the base. This is actually not even an, uh, what would be technically considered an amendment. Uh, again, an amendment to a project plan would be something that increases the dollar amount of the total plan, increases the size of the district, or arguably increases the scope of work to be provided in the project even though it did not increase the total amount. So um, we respectfully request that uh, this uh, reallocation uh, be approved uh, as submitted. Uh, I have been told many, many times this is a very normal uh, uh, housekeeping type of thing. But a little background on why you're looking at uh, significantly higher amount than was in the original project plan. One of the largest contributors uh, to that, to the tune of probably close to five hundred to six hundred thousand uh, dollars, perhaps more, was a uh, a number of additional changes and rechanges, redesigning that the De South Dakota Department of Transportation required on the stoplight. The stoplight on Highway 16 in Moon Meadows uh, uh, originally, I believe, uh, had an engineer's estimate and a, a bid of, like, I want to say, $275,000. Uh, it, um, it was uh, in, right in that $600,000 price range once it was improved, improved, and re-improved. And it went, I believe, back to DOT, I want to say, four times with additional changes as their staff seemed to change and so forth. The city uh, would look at it and approve it each time and send it back. This also resulted in significant time delays. Uh, I have uh, my engineer uh, here, uh, Kyle, with KTM, uh, and he'll, he can give you probably a little bit more of the gory details on the, co the, the cost and time uh, concerns that, or not concerns, but factors that were increased because of of the DOT changes, but that's okay. Uh, it's it's the t it's the it's the light. It's DOT's road, and it's uh, uh, a really really cool light now apparently, and it's going to do all the things that it needs to do for that intersection. Plus, uh, part of the cost was the um, installation of about three quarters of a mile of fiber optic, as I understand it, so it can communicate with the stoplight on Katrin and Highway 16. Now, we, meaning my, our, our company, my brothers and I, um, you know, because of these different uh, cost increases, we, we borrowed uh, more money. That's how it gets paid for. The, the contractors don't care that it's a TIF or not. They want to be paid. So all these amounts have been paid. There's approximately um, $4.1 million and change that's been been paid out, um, uh, and there are additional uh, costs that uh, resulted in increases, but there were some savings too. There was a million dollars allocated for uh, grading, cut and fill of, 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 uh, of valleys and hills and so forth in re installing the sewer main all the way to, from Catron to Moon Meadows. Uh, that grading actually came in uh, a quarter million less than anticipated. So there were there were some savings, and but there were some categories that had just significant, significant increases. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any further questions. But I do want to reiterate, as to any concerns that uh, any of the overlay TIF holders may have, is that um, we originally had pro had uh, proposed that uh, an actual amendment be made to the project plan that uh, considered. Uh, adding the detention ponds. Not right now would be the best time to do it, seemed logical. Uh, however, the project plan didn't clearly contemplate detention ponds. Therefore, uh, the scope of the project would be amended 
which um, uh, according to the, the city, and I think there, there's some merit to it on st with an under state statute as well, when you amend a plan, increase its scope in size or dollar amount, that it does reset that base. That's not happening. We withdrew that request. And uh, we, I believe, made that clear at the city council meeting uh, uh, that would have considered it last time. And we also made it clear at the, at the uh, legal and finance meeting uh, the time before last that would have also considered where we asked for this to be continued to today. Because um, we wanted to make it uh, uh, not, we, we did not want to confuse the issues of a reallocation of costs, which are uh, again, which is more housekeeping of this was less, this was more, and so it's this. Uh, we want to be very clear that as to not confuse those issues, we withdrew the request for increase of scope, meaning adding detention ponds as, a, as an item. That is not in there. This does not reset the base, and we ask that this reallocation be approved today. Um, I've got a very understanding bank. They were looking at this quite intently and would like to know a status, so um, I would open it for questions if any of you had any you know, questions of, of me. Thank you, Mr. Hay. It's not time for questions until oh, okay. we get to the item. All right, thanks. So seeing nobody, no other public comments, I will close public comment and we'll go to Community Planning and Development Services for item number nine, which is Number 16C A002, approve the request by City of Rapid City for Rapid City Arts Council to consider an application for an amendment to the comprehensive plan by adopting the Experience Rapid City Cultural Plan draft continued from June 15, 2016 Legal and Finance Committee meeting. And I would look for a motion. Go ahead, Sarah. I say we're also prepared to give you a short presentation if you like, so. Okay. How short is it? Five, ten minutes. If the committee wants it, the committee can have it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so this item is a comprehensive plan amendment being brought forth by the Rapid City Arts Council. Myself, Sarah Hansel with Long Range Planning and Pepper Massey with the Rapid City Arts Council. We'll just kind of give a brief overview of the plan. Um, this is an update to the 1993 cultural plan. Most of the items in that plan have been, um, have been achieved. A few examples would be um, the Journey Museum and Learning Center, the Rapid City Public Library expansion, the Dahl Art Center expansion, the Performing Arts Center. Um, so we're, we were really thrilled to start a, about a year, 10 month process that included over 850 local citizens input on this plan. Um, there are six overarching goals for the plan, which include cultural equity, education for creativity, cultural tourism. Let's see. Just quick here. Here are the six goals. I'll, I'll read those through those again. Um, cultural equity, education for creativity, cultural tourism and local audience development, nonprofit organization sustainability, creative economic development, and cultural leadership. Um, and so where we began were the three very broad goals uh, with regards to arts and culture in the city's comprehensive plan. That was just the jumping off place. And uh, after conversations with the community and focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, we drilled down into what our community needed, what the current assets were, uh, where we needed to go to strengthen uh, the arts and cultural infrastructure in Rapid City. Um, and these were the goals. They are prioritized. Um, of course, education, um, I think most of us will understand why that's important, uh, particularly in Rapid City schools, K through five. Uh, offers no formal visual arts education in our school systems. So education is extremely important to uh, individuals in our community. Cultural equity was the number one uh, goal. It is also a thread that is woven throughout the entire cultural plan. Each goal uh, addresses cultural equity. The community felt that it was um, extremely important that arts and culture 
play a role in uh, advancing our community, in uh, inclusion, um, and in setting a standard where uh, we would all work hard together as a community um, to eradicate racism and to open uh, our minds. And we think we can do that through the arts. We can, we can certainly help. Many of the goals are already being addressed, so there's work being done in almost every single one of these areas. It isn't simply by the Rapid City Arts Council. The Rapid City Arts Council asked permission by this, of, of the city to proceed with an updated plan. Um, but there are a number of organizations, groups, associations, and they're noted throughout the plan, as well as the sixth goal, which clearly says there are going to be certain groups that will take this responsibility and move it forward. So we don't intend for this to be a document that sits on the shelf. We uh, are very committed um, as a community to working on the city's very broad um, uh, three points uh, in the comprehensive plan and drilling down and working on uh, this comprehensive plan for arts and culture specifically in Rapid City. It's not costing the city anything. The entire bill has been covered to date by the Rapid City Arts Council. We were able to raise um, over $80,000 to fund this. We're open for any questions. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? I will give the floor to Jerry Wright. I'm just going to say it's a crying shame our children K through 5 don't get into the art training. Thank you. Indeed. And Lisa Modric, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first. Uh, I want to thank you and all the people that were involved. Uh, the back sheet goes on pages and pages with so much community uh, partnership. And uh, to pass that on, this was a lot of work that was done in order to advance the comprehensive plan. And um, I, I appreciate that. And I want to pass that thank you on to all involved. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to approve. I just want to say one thing. I want to reiterate what Jerry Wright said, how it's a shame that the school system does not have arts programs. So anyway, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Passes. Thank you. You will be here Monday night, won't you? Yes. Thank you. Now, item 10, number 16 TI-003, Highway 16 Sewer, a request by Ken Haig for Altaterra Development to consider an application to amend project plan for tax increment district number 70, Highway 16 Sewer for property generally described as being located Catron Boulevard from 5th Street to South U.S. Highway 16, then south along U.S. Highway 16 to Samus Trail and east to the proposed Highland Crossing Subdivision. This was continued from June 15th, 2016, Legal and Finance Committee meeting. And we have Patsy Horton that's going to give us an update on this. Thank you, Patsy. I'm going to go through these slides really quickly. As Kent had indicated, um, the current proposal before you today is a change from what you had looked at in June. He has removed the um, drainage pond proposal so that the base will not be uh, redeveloped or reestablished. There are a couple of reasons why um, the base would be reestablished re for um, our amendment purposes, either to um, change the boundary or to add a project cost that was not included in the original plan. As the city has always done any kind of amendment, whether it's in state law or not, based on our policy, if you're adjusting the line items as we are today, um, that also requires an amendment, even though it's not going to adjust the base valuation. So real quickly, just so that people understand um, how tax increment financing works. I have no screen here. Ah, oh, there we go. So um, what you see before you is generally um, uh, TIF 101, the base value, the starting base value is $100,000, generates a certain amount of money um, based on the current um, mill levy. 
Um, we assume that there's going to be a development within two or three years, so the um, new base value is um, estimated at a million dollars. The portion on the left in that little triangle, that's really called the increment. That's the dollar amount that goes toward paying any project cost that's been approved by the City Council. Um, today the base value um, estimated from 2008 is $22,894,400. And then below is the current breakdown of what the mill levy is um, for 2015. So here are just a couple pictures of the existing um, development out at um, Moon Meadows that Kent has put in. This is uh, Moon Meadows Drive. You, this is looking from the west and the construction of that uh, road. And then here's a little picture of where the sewer line is, is um, uh, graveled in. A actually, the sewer line is under that road. And this is at the terminus of Moon Meadows looking north. So the houses that you see um, in the very background, that's generally um, Edinburgh. So here's a picture of the uh, tax increment district boundary as it stands. When this was adopted in 2008, there was a plan to um, create a sewer line from Moon Meadows Drive, which is at the southern end of the property that extends all the way to 5th Street. Um, in the meantime, Catron Boulevard between 16 and 5th Street was reconstructed, and so the city, um, as part of that project, installed the sewer line from 5th up to Captain Boulevard. So then the only piece that was missing within this district was the connection of sewer from Catron down to Moon Meadows. And the current proposal um, and the current project plan that was adopted um, installed that sewer line from Catron down to Moon Meadows and then Moon Meadows was constructed as you saw. Some turn lane improvements were included in 16 and then the signal will be installed once the uh, warrants are met. So this is the master plan that was submitted with the amendment. Um, they do uh, anticipate a 160 unit apartment uh, complex. This is at the very eastern edge of the property where Moon Meadows um, connects and then uh, the north-south piece really is the extension of Healing Way from Captain Boulevard. I can't draw on my, my screen because there's, <laughs> I can't say anything so please bear with me. And this is actually um, the finalized proposed project costs. The first column is the original plan um, elements that were approved. The two middle columns were the ones that were um, submitted based on including the drainage ponds. And the two for consideration today are the, the very right hand side um, where you see uh, the reallocation of costs. The second column to the right is uh, the actual changes, anything in red generally was a change. And then what I did down at the bottom is uh, identify generally what the finalized um, changes were. There was a decrease in the financing costs as proposed by 854,000 leaving 2.2 million for interest. And the total capital costs identified just above that is $4.1 million, which was a little different than um, the original uh, project plan cost as well as the proposed amendment. So then the next thing that you need to know as part of this particular um, development area, there were two tax increment districts that were approved um, just recently. Um, one is for Black Hills Corp. That's the uh, tax district on the west side of the road and then Buffalo Crossing, which is on the east side of the road. Both of those have been approved subsequent to tax increment district 70 and the reason that's important is because any increment generated within the entire boundary of tax increment <coughs> district 70 which is the hatched area um, any revenues generated from any property within that district whether it's in a subsequent tax increment district or not all of those revenues go toward paying off the very first district that was approved so we need to know that as well the next piece here is the revenue information that was submitted back in um, December, January. Those numbers have not changed. Before you right now is the um, revenue based on the 10 unit apartment complex and you'll see that there is no information, um, no revenue generated from uh, for the tax year 2017, 2016, 2017 and generally 2018 and that's because it takes about two years to actually construct and occupy uh, an apartment building. 
So then the next piece in front of you is um, the revenue generated from Buffalo Crossing, which is on the southwestern or southeastern corner of Katrin and 16. Um, those revenues are included um, for your reference. And then the next piece is Black Hills Corp, revenue generated from their tax increment district. Um, and, and as uh, some of you may know, because Black Hills Corp is a um, centrally assessed business, they had to specifically request from uh, our state revenue department to create it, their very own taxing district so that the revenues generated from their facility will go into this special spot uh, pot so that you know these funds, those funds can be allocated to the TIF um, district instead of across the entire state. So then the next piece in front of you, in front of you is accumulation of all three of those uh, revenue projections. And that's generally what I use um, in the next couple sheets that you'll see is those uh, numbers with all three districts included. This is the original um, amortization schedule based on TID 70. The uh, values that were entered into the loan amount were um, the loan balance sheets at the end of last year, um, which was submitted with the application. The next sheet that you'll see is the um, revised project plan costs, and there was an increase of approximately uh, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars. So that does make a huge difference in um, the interest costs. And so here is a summary of all three of those um, plans and the interest costs for each of those districts with a total increase in, of about 1.1 million based on the loan valuation estimate uh, changes from TID 70. I'll just let you look at those for a minute. Um, Highway 70 or TID 70 is estimated to take a, approximately one year longer to pay off. Buffalo Crossing is also at one more year and Black Hills Corp is about two years longer. And so then there's always a question about um, how much value actually is actually in um, the various TIF districts and state law uh, restricts any municipality at a 10% total valuation for that property to be in a TIF and we are at about 3.2% currently. Even though, you know, this is, the sheet in front of you is from the end of December and the two t newest TIFs were approved um, after that. And so then one of the questions is, you know, have we ever reallocated costs? And then also have we ever changed um, uh, the base valuation on any TIF? And TIF 41, which was approved, um, I believe, in uh, July of 2003, that went through four different um, amendments. Some costs were increased, some costs were decreased. But yes, we have reallocated um, line item costs as well as changing the base valuation. And so if you were interested, I do have the new spreadsheets for all three of those districts. But with that, I just wanted to give you a little information on what the item is before you today. Thank you, Patsy. And I'm sure we've got a few people that are going to have more questions for you. Mr. Lorente, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And if I could have Mr. Haig approach the podium, please. Thank you, Mr. Haig. I have a question for you on this um, request F from the very beginning, actually. Uh, because each project plan and each development ha is required to have a drainage plan, uh, my question really goes to the heart of this change, which is that you have a region, you're requesting a regional detention pond. Why is there a change in drainage when one has to be presented for each TID and each project plan has to have a, their own plan for drainage. So if you could explain that, I would greatly appreciate it. You bet. And as a matter of clarification, um, uh, we do not uh, propose any uh, additional drainage ponds or retention ponds right now. That one has been withdrawn. Had we continued with that, that would have been considered an amendment that would have reset the base. However, we specifically withdrew that, not to confuse the issues. Um, as I've been uh, 
been instructed by a number of folks uh, uh, that have advised me on, on this, uh, on, on TIS in general, is that the reallocation of the existing plan as to cost, because no construction plan I, or construction estimate ever seems to ever come in exactly what you anticipated each item would. And that's what's before you today is, is simply saying, okay, we, there's a savings here, but there was an overrun here, and it realigns those costs. But we are not having any request for a, a drainage okay. retention ponds. Okay, so the, I guess the question then becomes, in the end, cause in a TID, and maybe, Patsy, you can maybe, you might, if you would approach the podium, because I'm still reading, at least in the item, that we're still looking at a regional drainage issue, but I don't know why it's still listed. But it doesn't matter at this point. My question is not that. My question is, if the total costs of the TID are not changing, why even submit a reallocation? As Kent mentioned, um, it's very common at the end of a project to adjust the line items to more consistently match what was actually expended. So because, you know, in the end when it's certified, if that number um, that's in the project plan is lower than what was actually expended, that difference is not reimbursable. So because, you know, the, the information that's submitted with the original proposal is an estimate, mm -hmm. that's why they come back with a line item shift um, to make those more consistent with actual expenditures. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lorente. Mr. Wright, you have the floor now. Along the same lines, the drainage structures will be built. They're just being paid for with reallocated money. Is that correct? Uh, no. Um, the, the ponds at this time do not have a means uh, for which to be paid. Um, it, it's been our position that it's, it's the logical time to do it. Most of the work has been done because when Promise Road was built, a lot of, uh, m most of the studies have been completed for drainage because the natural drainage had to be computed so that the culverts were properly sized under healing way and so forth. So much of it's been done and we're, we're, we're looking at other alternatives for the funding of the detention ponds, whether it's something the city does or whether it's something that is part of this project uh, does, does happen. Um, we're, we're open to a number of, of ideas right now. Again, it's, it'll be about 280,000 or so that we would take to build two retention ponds that were approved by the city back in 2005 by, by a study. It's exactly what the city uh, uh, desires as a matter of policy as far as its uh, comprehensive drainage plan. Um, but that is not before the, 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 the uh, committee today at all. Uh, this reallocation does not include any allocation or dollar amount for the construction of detention ponds. Uh, it is only those things that were specifically uh, contemplated and related costs during, uh, in, the, in the developer's agreement. And an, an important thing in the developer's agreement, too, is on, on page, one second, <laughs> three, um, it, uh, it, it contemplated the reallocation uh, may we, uh, the developer may seek to revise the project plan, reallocate project costs without increasing the total project costs of $6.410 million. Because it's a very common place to do that. Um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a housekeeping uh, exercise essentially to true up the actual costs of as to where they went. And that's what we're seeking today, but we are not uh, muddying the water, so to speak, regarding, no pun intended, regarding retention ponds. Uh, I, I have further questions on this. Um, as you know, we have mo numerous items to look at, and, and I could be an error, but I went to the agenda item and went to the staff report dated May 26th of 2016, and it shows a uh, amendment, project approved costs, and amendment with number one with approved costs, and the original was 6.4 million, which is, that was the original estimate, correct? For that the was the original total dollar amount set in the TIF back in 08. Correct. And then I see on this amendment with number one, with approved costs, which included the drainage ponds of 6.4 million. So I'm sitting there in my simplistic little mind, reading a staff report saying, well, we've reallocated resources because we've had increased costs in some areas and decreases in other, 
and it looks like with the, based on the original estimate of dollars, we could still get the drainage structures built. And if that estimate is the same, excuse me, if the final estimate is the same as the initial estimate, the impact should be minimal or nothing to the overall process. So I'm sitting there saying, okay, what's the deal? What's the problem? Well, the, the, I think and maybe um, maybe Patsy should answer okay. that. Um, what is the? Why are we? Why can't we just? If the big th big issue in my mind is the amount of money that's financed over a period of time, <coughs> and if it's a project we've approved, and most of us have been in the industry understand that when you build something significant, there's going to be changes. Some are going to go up, some are going to go down. The fact they're able to get it to the same amount is amazing. What's the beef? The base valuation has to be redetermined if you add a project cost, which oh we didn't. Know, We're at six point four million. Correct, but you're adding a specific line item that wasn't in the original plan. That's not allowed. That's not allowed unless you redetermine the base, and to do that, the increment um, that is that we're capturing now we lose altogether because then the new base is generally estimated at about thirty million, and so it's going to take quite a bit longer to pay off, and it doesn't only impact. TID 70, but it also impacts 76 and 77, which is Black Hills Corp and Buffalo Crossing. Okay, another question. If we take this stock dams out, excuse me, stormwater detention ponds, we're at about 6 point, what, 3 million? It's still 6.4 because they've, um, let me go back to the spreadsheet that I relinked today. <coughs> So if you'll look, this is, this is the sheet that you want to look at on the very right-hand side, the last two columns. So it takes out the regional ponds, which is you know, generally the first item in the second grouping, and then the first item in the third grouping. The third grouping is a combination of phase one and phase two. There are no regional ponds identified in there, but they've reallocated you know, generally those funds to potential interest costs. And just as a side note, you had asked about the drainage ponds. Our current subdivision regulations require all um, development to have their on-site drainage within their property if there is no regional detention available. So whether, whether or not it's inside a TIF or outside a TIF, you still have to provide on-site drainage for each development. And I think the on-site development, if I'm correct, is if it's an oversized and they pay for their share, the city pays for their share, correct? Generally, but with this particular instance, unless those ponds, uh, with Kent's proposal, the regional ponds are not on his property. They're on property to the north, generally. So they're receiving water from places other than his property? There, there's, some, there's some regional pond, regional water that's being captured on those proposed ponds to the north. Speaking for myself, I, I need more time to study this because I, 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 in my own, again, my little mind up here is looking at the, the theory that we're financing an improvement that bottom line hasn't changed. We're not changing the district, but apparently is it state statute or is it policy, state statute state that requires statute. A reset? And there's, okay, we, I think we need to study this a little longer. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. I'd like to help them. And what we can do. Thank you, Mr. Wright. And our finance officer has something to chime in with. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add on a little bit to what Patsy said. Another reason why the base has to be reestablished, if they were to add the detention ponds as a regional um, item on the project plan, state law says that you have to have your projects under construction. Uh, within the first five years that the TID was created. This would have been well outside the, those first five years because that I believe it was um, the, the TID was actually established in 2008. And so because it's outside those five years, they possi couldn't possibly have it under contract already when it wasn't in the project plan. So that's another reason why it had to have been reestablished had they tried to move forward with that part of the plan. Um, I also want to tag on that we have done this quite frequently where we've 
adjusted line items within um, the project plan itself, whether it's from another line item that came in at a lower price or whether it was a line item that they did not um, end up following through on. In fact, I will tell you just as a heads up that the city will be in the same boat with one of our lift stations. Uh, Patsy and Dale and I are trying to get an amendment done for us to reallocate costs to on that lift station because those costs came in higher than expected, but we can take it from another line item within that that budget. So um, it, both of them have, have indicated that we've done this in the past where we've reallocated costs and we that is something that we have definitely done and we'll probably continue to do with the, any TIDs that come in. I guess I'm going to ask because I'm basing my discussion on staff report that was included in our packet and so forth. There's a mountain of material to read and I asked for a copy, written co or printed copy of all that stuff so I can look at it, contrary to burning up my printer. And the other thing is, could we have a, a staff recommendation that is current on the issue today versus May for Monday night? Yes, my apologies. I just got this information together less than a half hour before your meeting. My apologies. No, that's okay. I, <laughs> Thanks for that. I, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wright. And Mr. Laurenti, you have the floor again. Thank you, Chair. This will be it for me. Uh, Patsy, and my question to you is this. I understand the reallocation. My question now is about the increment, especially where we're reallocating funds. Are we reallocating funds in shared areas where TIDs overlap? Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, the only, the only improvements that were done were located, um, <coughs> well, part of the sewer line was, uh, <coughs> I'm, look, I'm looking for a map, there, there we go. Um, part of the sewer line was included in Buffalo Crossing, but none of the costs within TED 70 will carry over into um, TED 76, which is Buffalo Crossing. Um, Kent has all of the costs associated with the sewer line, um, Moon Meadows, the turn lanes in 16 and the traffic signal. So any costs associated with Buffalo Crossing TIF, they're all Buffalo Crossing costs. So the, 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 the overlapping is only because the revenues generated from 76 and 77 go toward paying off the costs that are in front of you today. Okay, so my question then is, if there were in, or if there were costs, my, my question really pointed is, where TIDs 76 and 77 share boundaries with 70, are there increases there because the increment from all of those, or the overlap, needs to go to 71st, correct? Yes. Every, so yes. was there an impact in those areas? Yes, with the... Um, their financing costs. And what are we looking at, the difference in that again? I mean, the financing costs. So will it take longer now for the increment to pay that off first before that shared boundary area, that increment part there goes towards 76 and 77? Correct. And this is the form that I came up with um, based on the revised um, estimated capital costs from today versus January that were used. Yeah, I, did, I wasn't quite sure that that's exactly what that uh, illustrated, and I, that's why I wanted to ask the question, because that's sort of how I took that, but I wanted to verify that that indeed was the case, that there are changes here, but this does not trigger uh, a uh, reevaluation of the base. Correct. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Wright has the floor again. Thank you. One, one last question I asked for updated staff. Is there the possibility that we can get a resolution to this issue from the three main players from 70, 71, and excuse me, the three, and their city staff, some resolution by Monday night? We will sure best. do our best. Because I can see where this is all, I mean, if I had, and in Kent's shoes, I, I certainly would like to see this investment go as planned and see the drainage improvements done. But I'm totally sympathetic with the other people out there 
that have made their plans accordingly now it's a change on them so and, and I'd like to add one more thing you know all of these estimates that you see in every one of the amortization schedules all of that is based on the revenue projections that are provided to staff to come up with these numbers so if you know if nothing is built out there all bets are off I understand that you know so it, it really depends on the applicants moving forward with the projections as indicated otherwise they're all responsible for you know all of the costs in their TID with or without an increment but I can also sympathetic with uh, someone else as an investor within the area having made their financial plans and all of a sudden they see a reset that affects theirs. So exactly. we need to work this all out. Good. Yeah. And I'll stop. I'm going to let you have the floor, Mr. Lorente, for the last time. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. I did not tell the truth or lied because I said I was done with my last. But my question to you, Patty, or uh, Patsy, I'm sorry, is at this point, uh, I assume this TID was based on a 20 year. Is that correct? Yes, from 2008. If we changed the length of the TID, would that trigger a reevaluation? State law, yes, yes, it would. It would. Okay, thank you. And thank you, committee. And if you'll give me a little leeway, I got a couple of questions. Thank you, Patsy, while you're there. Uh, my first question is, the capital cost changed in the project. And you said also the interest cost changed in the project. So we stayed within what we had originally allocated for the TIF, correct? Correct. But the financing interest charges change, so does that mean that the interest went up or the interest went down? When I put these um, numbers together, um, way before 76 and 77, actually about the same time 76 and 77 came through, um, I based it on the financial information that was submitted with the application. Um, that was uh, about 3.3 million, which is at, in the first column. And shortly after that, um, I was given a new loan piece of loan information, which was nine hundred and some thousand dollars more, um, based on you know the current loan within this particular area. And so now we've got an adjustment to account for that. What was the difference in interest rates? Do you know? The interest rate's the same. Interest rate was the same. I guess my question is: is if the numbers are staying the same? Uh, and within the, the allowable TIF or TID, um, why are the finance charges changing on the other end of the other two TIFs? Because um, the original amortization schedule was 70 that I put together, paying off um, 76 and 77, the loan amount was 900 and some thousand dollars lower than what the actual costs were based on the information that I had gotten at the very beginning. So at the very beginning, what number did you use to calculate this? You used? 3.3 .3 million, okay. that first column. And I guess my question column. is, is why wouldn't you use the maximum allow allowable if you have two other TIDs that are coming in behind it? Because I think the problem that we're running into here is we've got two TIFs behind this that have both been approved and now we're changing the financing on them and we're, we're changing, well, the interest on them which changes their financing on them and I guess that will bring my next question up if you would bring up the slide that shows what the maximum amount is on TID 76 and TID 77 because with this new interest added into them do we stay within their guidelines? So uh, to answer your question, um, when an amendment comes in to change the line item costs based on the final costs that have been approved, that was the number that I had thought was correct based on the final financial information that was submitted. And which would have been absolutely fine if there wasn't two other TIFs behind this one. That's what's causing the problem is the two other exactly. TIFs behind this one. Because we allocate money on TIFs all the time. I mean, I've been on the council for five years. I've seen it happen. And 
you know, that's a reality. But the reality is, with two other TIFs behind this one, if we're using one number and that, uh, that number changes all of a sudden, that changes the two behind you. Now, what is to say that TIF 76 or TIF 77's bankers say, we're not going to give you another $400,000. We're not going to give you another $300,000. Because those are the TIFs that are going to pay off Ken Hague's TIF, no offense. But these are the TIFs right now at your build out that are going to pay off that original TIF. So I do, I, I want to see this go through, but I don't want to punish the other two TIFs that were already allocated behind this one. And it's, 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 it's one of those where we're stuck between a rock and a hard place because you have all the right in the world to come forward and ask for these costs because you're staying within the guidelines of your TIF. But on the other hand, what do we do on the back end of it to make this so it's, go ahead, Mr. Hey. Thank you. Um, as a matter of clarification, the, uh, yes, the, the, the original dollar amount that was projected uh, in the project plan in 2012 or 13, it was, uh, did not change. However, the interest rate at that time was contemplated as it was, is mm -hmm. and was normal in city's practice is to, is to anticipate an interest rate of 9%. That gives you all sorts of leeway for all sorts of swings of economic changes and, you know, I'm old enough to remember in the 70s where it was 16% interest rates. So it wasn't beyond the realm of possibility. But, but the actual interest rate is, is 6%. So there is a tremendous amount of interest uh, that is being saved, number one. And that amount is a dynamic amount from which uh, these additional costs were able to be taken and other line items because there were savings. There were actual savings in other line items. And again, you get that reallocation. So the interest uh, went down because of it's a lower interest rate than was originally contemplated and a faster payoff due to the other development going on uh, inside and around the district by the two other applicants, by the two other TIF uh, developers. So, um, as far as how that connects with the detention ponds, a, a, ticks, a, a, ta, a, tick tack, a TIF may be amended up to its very last year uh, if the, the city should decide it wants to uh, go forward with a comprehensive plan because uh, uh, Alta Terra Development Company and the other uh, two developers uh, decided to do this uh, or decided to come up with, an, with a solution that would uh, absolutely, and I understand that. You know, I understand that if this was an amendment to the TIF, you would have to have the other TIFs in line do an amendment too. But that's not the question I have. The question I have is, what do we do about the back end of this TIF where they are incurring more costs than they walked into believing they were going to have? There's a, the, the only re, there's a, they were given a base amount that, as Patsy pointed out, based on what our company uh, submitted as far as our loan balance sheets. Uh, a loan balance sheet, I think, is reasonably, she reasonably deducted that that's the amount of loans, and at that time, 3.2, that were currently expended. Mm -hmm. Well, there was, still, there was still work going on, and there were still a significant a number of bills out there no, I understand that too, Kim. I, I understand that. And this is probably a discussion we should have for Monday night. There's no reason to get into the, this. And maybe you and I can sit down for a while and we can discuss this more. So, or, yeah, or before Monday night, maybe everybody can get together and discuss this a little bit more. But I think more of what I'm worried about now, I'm not worried we're not going to get through this. We're not going to find a way to make this work. I'm more worried about this happening again in the future because it could possibly happen again in the future. So, and we'll talk about it more Monday night, Patsy. I'm done talking. I'm, I'm ready to get through with this item. So why don't we just, if I can get a motion, we will get this moving to Monday night. Thank you. Make a motion to Monday night without recommendation. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? It, 
goes Monday night with no recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now from the city attorney's office, item 11, LF 071316-06, introduction and first reading of ordinance number 6132, an ordinance to modify the procedure for approval of vision account projects by amending section 3.16.090 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. And I look for a motion or someone to speak on the item. I've got a motion to approve and second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 12, Legal Finance 071316-07, introduction and first reading of ordinance number 6133, an ordinance to update the contracting authority delegated to department directors by amending section 3.04.090 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. I've got a motion to approve and second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. I'm looking for a motion, motion to, to adjourn. adjourn. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.